Hello, I'm Rob Bonnet. Welcome to this edition of Extra Time. What does an international cricketer, a leading run scorer of his time, and a player who relished the machismo challenge of facing the world's fastest bowlers do when his confidence is shot and he's finally told it's time to retire? Well, in the case of our guest today, England's Robin Smith, he enters a downward spiral of depression fueled by drink involving also divorce and eventually a determination to kill himself. Well, thankfully, he's still here and he's about to tell us his story. Smith, welcome to Extra Time. Uh, a test batting average for England of uh, 43.67 from 64 matches between your debut in 1988 and your last test match in 1996. It's a proud record. It's a very proud record and, uh, and a record that I, I had no idea as a, as a youngster that uh, a, I'd be playing test match cricket having been brought up in uh, the apartheid system in yes. South Africa. Um, very, very lucky that uh, mum and dad uh, were both born in England. And, An encouraging uh, sporting environment for your um, parents? Very, very much so. Yeah. Um, and before we go any further, uh, Rob, it's lovely to see you again. And uh, I don't often do uh, uh, interviews uh, anymore. And uh, just uh, you suggested earlier on about uh, enjoying playing fast bowling. I can assure you that I'm more nervous now <laughs> chatting with you than facing uh, Malcolm Marshall, Kurt Lee Ambrose and Courtney Mulsh, even without a box on. Um, but, uh, so please forgive me if I sound a little, a little you, nervous. You don't need any protection today, Robin. Okay, absolutely fine. Fabulous. Well, Thank since you, so you talk so. about your, uh, your enjoyment uh, at facing fast bowling, especially the West Indian quicks, let me uh, take a quote then from your autobiography, The Judge. I absolutely loved it, you said. I'm an adrenaline junkie and nothing has ever given me a hit as good as that. What, what was it about fast bowling that you enjoyed so much? Um, look, I think it, it would have been the, the confidence of, of knowing that uh, I felt comfortable about fast bowling. In, in South Africa, we, um, we, were, um, we played on uh, very fast wickets yes. uh, early on. So it came naturally it, in a way. It, it did. I mean, very much uh, very unlike India, where they're great players of spin bowling because they play on wickets that are conducive and low and slow and conducive mm -hmm. to spin bowling. Whereas in South Africa and, uh, and, and had, uh, we had this, uh, this net in the back of our garden and uh, we had a bowling machine and, and it was you continually uh, bowling and he cranked it up, did he? He cranked oh, it up fast. Oh, the old man did, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. He, he thought I was very weak if I couldn't face the bowling uh, machine at 85 miles an hour when I was 15 years old. Wow. So rushing through about so that's uh, something that uh, that I'd, I'd worked on at a, at a very early age and no and, fear uh, no fear in front actually, of the band uh, actually I, I, I didn't the only fear I have now is uh, looking back on my career and seeing the guys wearing the grills um, being hit on the grill being hit in the helmet mm -hmm. and thinking my goodness gracious me um, I really should have worn a grill during my career well, but at no stage did I ever feel uncomfortable or um, ever feel that uh, I was going to be hit in the face yeah not uncomfortable physically, but a little bit uncomfortable mentally. I'm going to take a, a little bit of a quote once again from your book. I may have looked and performed as though I was bulletproof, but I was hiding a heart and mind of glass. What did you mean by that? You know, it's, um, it's very, very difficult, uh, Rob, when you, um, you know, when you are, when you, um, are growing up as, as a youngster, um, as Robin Smith, um, a shy, very reserved, um, very modest, very caring, softly gentle, spoken. gentle, <laughs> softly spoken, um, and uh, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into um, um, a career at Hampshire where um, you know you uh, feel as if you had to be a little something that you aren't, and uh, mm. it goes. And I mention uh, gently in the book about uh, um, you know fractured identity, um, about being the Robin Smith off the field. And uh, and this judge, the judge on the your field, nickname. yes, on the field, because your hair was, uh, yes. was longer and yeah, more cringy yeah. than it is and now, and it looked like a judge's yes. wig. <laughs> and uh, so you you know you're always battling through your life uh, between you know the the real Robin Smith and the judge that people okay. seem to uh, love and enjoy watching. Again, you you, you mentioned this in your book, a, a real eagerness to please. What was that about? Was that about trying to please your father? 
Um, yeah, look, we're brought up in a very disciplined uh, and a very different era. Um, yeah. As, as uh, the youngsters are brought up here in, in, uh, in England and, uh, and South Africa, and it was a, a very uh, a tough environment to, uh, you know, to be brought up in. And Dad was a huge disciplinarian and, uh, and always wanting to please. So when he dragged me out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning to go and train and whatever, mm. there were no questions asked. And, um, but I, I, I think was I that, have... What was that? Was that tough love or was that something... Uh, very, no, just very tough love. Okay. Tough love. And, uh, and he just wanted... Uh, he was never a, a great sportsman. His uh, sister was um, um, South Africa's leading uh, golf um, champion for 25 years. And, and I just think that he wanted me to become a very good sportsman and, mm -hmm. and encourage me, whether it be uh, during rugby season or athletic season or, or cricket season. Yes. You know, he just wanted me to uh, make the very best of uh, what ability I might have. And that ability was about facing fast bowling especially. But, but spin bowling, it was perceived at least you had a problem. Uh, Shane mm -hmm. Warne, mm -hmm. who's now a friend mm -hmm. and in mm -hmm. fact wrote a forward mm -hmm. to your book, mm -hmm. uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest spin bowler that's, that's mm, ever mm, lived. Mm. Um, w was that fair criticism that you couldn't play spin bowling? Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, I think it was, uh, Rob. You know, um, if, if you were brought up in, uh, in South Africa and uh, thinking back now, there was only probably two or three uh, de half decent spinners in South Africa. There might have been uh, Alan Curry or Dennis Hobson, but um, the conditions that we played under were never conducive to spin bowling. Um, mm -hmm. We're brought up on, on fast, hard wickets, and and uh, you know you take a comparison to uh, to the Indian players. You know the Indian players are brought up on uh, dust bowls. You know they they, they you know and uh, they're not encouraged to bowl fast because you can't bowl fast in India. And uh, and all these younger Indian players come up and they learn how to play spin bowling beautifully. Yes. Um, and then they come to Australia or maybe come to England when they suffer, you know, struggle a little bit with the, the seam movement and the swing. Um, and it's the same as wherever you're brought up in the world, you get you know you you get accustomed to to those conditions. And, uh, and that's where you become better players yeah. in those conditions. Yeah. To, towards the end of your England career, the perception in the English press was that you couldn't play spin bowling uh, and uh, a sense maybe that it undermined your confidence. You, you write, I dreaded batting like never before. Mm. Uh, to be honest, the more people spoke about it and uh, the, the, the more I started to believe in my inadequacies right. against that. And that's when and this my, was very distracting. And that's, and that's when I lost confidence and I didn't become as, uh, um, you know, a good player yes. in the end. That's what I wanted to... Let's, uh, let's drill try. down into that then because it was in 2003 eventually that your contract with Hampshire was terminated. Uh, cricket was your life and it was over. So many sportsmen I've talked to about retirement say it's a kind of a death. Uh, there's an emptiness there. Uh, and, and what followed after that obviously was a, a downward spiral, as I described in my introduction, uh, into uh, drink, certainly, uh, and a depression. So, so those, uh, uh, as that was happening then, did you, did you feel that you were on some kind of slippery slope? Look, at, um, you know, cricket absorbed my life from waking up the age of uh, dad dragged me out of bed at uh, five o'clock in the morning, every single morning, uh, to practice cricket, all the way through till 40. Um, it absorbed my life. Um, I, I, cradled, I cradled the game. I loved the game. I embraced it. Um, and it was just everything to me in my life. And when the time came when I was encouraged to retire um, then you know it wasn't my at the at the time it wasn't my choice and I've written in the book was my choice mm. I was disappointed at the time um, I, I, I felt that I had another year left of me uh, maybe for the wrong reasons and I now look back and it was the wrong reason because Shane Warne was back at the club and I want to have another great but, but year at with, the time, with, with I'm, I'm sorry to drill down to the details here, but at the time your, your marriage was disintegrating. Uh, not, mean, at, not, at not, that, no, not at but, that but, particular but, time. But, I mean, over uh, a period of years, yeah. uh, you, you certainly hit the bottle, yes. vod the vodka bottle. Uh, there'd, been, uh, there'd been instances where you'd been unfaithful to your wife as yes. well. Yeah, uh, yeah. This was a very, very low ebb in your life, wasn't it? it, it yes, it was. Um, your business look, also look, was I, I, would, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would suggest that this is... Uh, after I had uh, finished playing professional sport, the, the club in, in employed me as in, in an ambassadorial role where I'd be hosting in the Robinson Suite at uh, the AGS Bowl um, and uh, I'd have the, uh, the vodka, lime and soda and then it would turn into a double. You'd become an alcoholic. And a triple. Uh, 
on the verge, yeah, um, relying, starting to rely on alcohol rather than enjoying it. Um, it was as, a refuge uh, from, from, uh, from the reality. W w watching, watching the plays, wanting to be out there yes. and, uh, and desperately yes. wanting to be there. Um, but uh, the, the, the worst part was, um, was we, we, uh, I felt that I needed a change. I felt that um, you know, I was, I was getting into rut in England. I didn't really know how to get out. I was doing a lot of afternoon speaking, which again encouraged the drinking and everything. Um, so you so, emigrated? So, yeah. Immigrated to Perth, yeah. uh, spoke to my uh, my wife Kathy, wanted a, a nice uh, clean start. Yeah. Um, my marriage was was struggling for a long period of time, but I really wanted to make it work because I just felt that having two great children was important for us to grow up as a family. Um, I also felt that maybe the opportunities in Australia uh, would be better than they are here. So, um, with her blessing, she left her family here. With her blessing. We moved to uh, to Australia, mm -hmm. hoping for a new start, hoping for a bright future. Uh, Why didn't it happen? Um, well, it, it, well, it, well, it, well, a couple of things. Firstly, um, the, the dream of trying to get my marriage, living in this little dream world, thinking uh, naively that just moving countries, you know, all of a sudden things would change. Well, it well it didn't. Um, I uh, then took uh, took on a, on, on a franchise the uh, the Missouri Cricket Helmet, which I developed with my partner in 1989. Mm -hmm. So we, we owned that. I uh, then promoted it in Australia, became the most successful helmet in Australia. Um, it became so successful that I uh, I ran out of money, um, and that was taken away from me because I couldn't cope with. Uh, running a business I mean there, there is one thing that I learn that you know as a as a sportsman um, you know I can uh, definitely help try and promote uh, or, or try and develop the best protective helmet in the world you can promote the helmet but to try and run a business is something very very different mm -hmm. and don't even get your hands tight so so that collapsed which then I had to sell my house um, and uh, my marriage broke up I started drinking heavily and quite happy to say to you uh, that over a period of four years I drink a bottle and a half of vodka a day from the bottle. That's serious stuff isn't it? Uh, it is, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's, it's very sad uh, and, um, and I had no idea how to stop, I couldn't mm. stop, I knew, I knew it was wrong, I knew I had to stop but I didn't know how to. No. Um, and then you couldn't uh, reach out for help? Well, well, I could, and this is why I'm, I'm saying that, you know, uh, a lot of people should reach out. I could have done, I had too much pride, you know, I just felt I could do it on my own, um, I could get through this on my own, and you can't. There is a lot of people out there, now I understand and realise yes. there is so much help out there, so many beautiful people, and uh, so many institutes, the Players Creed Association here, um, and their partners in uh, in Australia is absolutely sorry in uh, in England absolutely yeah. magnificent. The, the, the and very worst of it all, excuse me for interrupting, yeah, but the very okay. worst of it all, Robin, is is when you were disowned by your children, wasn't it? I mean, well, that, that well, that's, that's, the, that's the worst. That, that's the worst. When when uh, when all you want in your life is to be to be a great father, and uh, and I dedicated my life to to being as good a father and as. Uh, um, fair as fair as I could, and and, uh, and I had a great relationship with my children, which um, was temporarily destroyed. It it, it was, yeah. And uh, um, uh, my my wife uh, Kathy at the time was in England, and uh, I, was, I drank too much, stupidly went and picked up my daughter from school, ran over a little uh, uh, a little bump, and she said, "Dad, stop the car! You've been drinking." Mm. Stopped the car. She got away home, and uh, on the way back, I was done for drink and driving. Mm. And uh, you, you write uh, that you'd become a slave to alcohol. You were ashamed, disgusted, and scared. Yeah, all those things, and 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 many more. Um, and um, anyway, so you know, Barry Richards, who was a, is a great uh, family friend, knew that I was in uh, serious trouble. He, um, he he got in touch with me, and he said, "Look, why don't you go and stay at my apartment uh, in Scarborough?" right next to the beach and uh, that uh, you can maybe recoup recuperate, try and get yourself sorted um, and that didn't really really happen. I'd, I'd, I'd walk down to the beach with you know with a bottle of half a bottle of vodka, look up at uh, you know want, wanting to finish my life. I, I just yes. I, I, I was in such a deep hole. Yes. 
I felt there was no way. So there were no two way, people. No way out. There were two people who came to your rescue. It was your son Harrison, yes. but also then later uh, your partner, your new partner, yes. Karen. Yes. So tell us yeah. the story of, of how that happened. Um, well, we'll, ju we'll just uh, going back, sitting on sitting on the beach, looking up at that rendezvous hotel in, in Scarborough. Um, I thought that's the place, and then I thought to myself, well, what 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 place are you talking about, Robin? You start talking about yourself, you know, and uh, said so that's the place where I'm going to finish it. That's and I knew exactly how I was going to finish my life. I'd had enough. You planned it. I planned it. I'd had enough of living like I was, lost the the, the lost hope, lost uh, respect, uh, laughing stock, friends, family. I thought no, um, I'm not going to put my family through any of this anymore. The easiest for them is just for me to put them out their misery, and I, I, I would never have had um, the the guts to have gone and bought a gun. Not that I know where to buy a gun uh, from. Uh, and you planned it uh, despite knowing that this would cause enormous hurt to your to your children. You don't think, you know, you don't think logically. You know, you you, you don't think things like you just think that I was causing so much hurt to them anyway. Mm. You know, I just thought, well, well, maybe. You know, finishing it off, and uh, now I know. I look back, and goodness gracious me, if you know, if people read the book, please, listen, you know, understand that it's it's not the way to go. So, so, so Harrison basically had a conversation with you in which he reaffirmed well, his love for you. Three, right. three, three days later, uh, I knew it was going to happen. I planned it. I bought the medication. Um, I knew exactly what I was going to do. And uh, three days later, he saw me curled up on the couch. He had a key to get into my apartment. And he came and he gave me some love and he said, Dad, I love you. You know, we love you. We still love you. But you've got to get yourself right. You can win back the respect of everyone. But Dad, you have to sort yourself out. And, uh, and from that moment on, I then went and stayed with my, uh, with my brother for a little while, trying to uh, reduce my, my, my drinking. Um, that didn't really help that much. Uh, went on again, lived on my own uh, in another apartment for six months. Again, lonely, um, nothing to do. What 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 saved me really was I still worked, re you know, religiously twelve hours, twelve hours a day for six days a week, and I cycled seventy kilometres a day. You know, I'd stop every ten k's and. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, you had to. I mean, you know, um, it, it just gives you this warmth. It, it uh, allows you to feel at peace with yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, um, and then everything feels okay. But it's not okay. It, it isn't so okay. So then, this takes us then, doesn't it, to your first meeting with Karen, your new partner. Yeah, and then, and then I, I thought to myself, well, well look, who's going who's to who's gonna be there to support you? Then if you at the end of the day, my brother's fantastic, but at the end of the day, who is, who's always going to be there for you, mom and dad? So I thought the only way um, for me to recover is to go back and live with mom and dad. And they lived in the same same apartment as as Karen. Karen had only uh, moved down from Christmas Island, um, and um, uh, not not far, well, still part of Western Australia, but not far from uh, Indonesia. She had only just moved down with her young family. Mm -hmm. And uh, she saw me by the pool, and uh, and it was so lovely, you know, because she knew nothing about cricket. You the could only person open your heart to her, and she didn't the, really know who you were. No, did no, no. The only no. person she knew was uh, was, was uh, Shane Warne. <laughs> so, so, so it was actually quite nice to to uh, to talk to somebody who who, who had no idea. What are who her was. qualities that have, as it were, brought you back from the brink? Um, you know, her. Um, you know, she listened. Um, she um, her empathy. Um, her understanding, um, but 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 mainly just uh, as as a as a friend. She she knew that you know I was a I was a good guy in a very very bad place, right. and uh, you know she um, she you know she lived she lived in Christmas Island. She's one of those um, when the boat people came in, she was there to help you know the refugees you know and things. So she's always had a lot of empathy and uh, and she, and she could see that I was a decent bloke. Yes. And probably only, the only one at the time. <laughs> I've got a couple of more points to put yeah. to you. I, I mean, the first is this incident, which occurs 
several months, maybe years. I'm a bit confused with the timeline. When you're back in the same hotel, you're on the balcony where yeah. you had contemplated ending your life. Yeah. And suddenly, the oh, result. Oh, jeez. I mean, you know, this... Uh, oh, Rob, you know, you, uh, you, you uh, mention it and, and um, you know, to try and relive that, um, you know, is... You know, I'll, I'll try and, you know, remain strong, but, you know... Having, having walked along the beach, I had visualised exactly what I was going to do. I knew how I was going to end yes. my life. And then you saw um, it and then, up and then, uh, and then three years later, when, when I was clean, wasn't, wasn't drinking, um, and I was approached by uh, um, Yellow Jersey to, uh, to write this book, and Rob Smythe, who is an absolutely amazing journalist. Um, and uh, I thought, I thought to myself, well, you know, we we you know, I spoke to Carol and said, you know, where, where, where are we going to make the start? And she said, well, look, let's go to the rendezvous because it's probably a, one of the only hotels in the area. So we went to the rendezvous. We, we, you know, we got a, a an apartment on the bottom floor. And as I sat on the balcony, I just saw this poof, just drop a yard away from me. I looked down a yard away from me, and I shouted, Karen. Said, said, someone's just trying to commit themselves, uh, commit, you know, uh, you know, take their, own uh, take their own life, commit suicide, and 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 fortunately she'd fallen into a little drain, so she hadn't hit it hard. She'd fallen to this drain, and she's still breathing. And Jesus, I jumped over, I jumped over the the railing, ran to her rescue, held her hand, and she looked at me. With these beautiful eyes, she had done her makeup. Her hair was beautiful. Uh, her fingernails just done. She she was immaculate. And she just looked at me. And her heart was still pumping. And I held her hand. And she squeezed my hand. By then, Karen had then come and joined on the other side and, and held her hand. We, she had actually just phoned the uh, the paramedics, and they were on the way. And uh, and we both said to her, "Look, you're not on your own because I think the last thing you want to do." As in your dying moments, wanting to be, you know, on your own, mm. and uh, I just just looked into her eyes, and and the, the 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 flashes that came back to me was, this is this is what I was going to do to myself, and there was no she didn't she then released my hand, and she stopped breathing. And I went, oh, yeah, Jesus, you know, and I just thought. That that's that was that was going to be me three years earlier. That's a harrowing story now. It must have been a very harrowing. Oh, and and I'd, you know, and to hear. It, and well, uh, I'd like to end briefly on, on an optimistic note. Mm. Oh, you're, that's, you're, you're thank now you. in good form. Oh, fantastic! Absolutely brilliant. You know that it's always you know you've always got to work hard, haven't you? In in, uh, yes. in everything. And and as I said, I was inspired by uh, this book. Um, I do read um, a lot, particularly in. Uh, you know, in, in Australia about, you know, about mental health, about guys, you know, having this wonderful career. And, uh, and all I say to uh, leaving a little message, there is a book of learnings. You can read through the book and it's, uh, it's a very raw story, pretty tough for myself. Um, but we've, we've got to be prepared for life after our sport. You know, and it, and maybe it, it happens in in uh, business as well. Somebody's been working at the same business for forty years. They get to sixty, and uh, they, they you know they they retire. And what do you do? That if we all fall into that that trap of of feeling maybe worthless as well. Okay, Robin Smith. That, thank you very much for telling us your uh, story. Rob, thank, thank you so so very, thank much. You very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you.